infrastructure in Asia. Thank you. I thought uh, we have a very smooth session in the morning, and likewise, we would like to have this afternoon session doing it that way, meaning that uh, all our speakers, our distinguished panelists, will each given eight minutes. With the exception of uh, Philip Kevin, he asked for two more minutes because I want, we want him to set up a scene for the discussion uh, uh, with various uh, panelists. And um, I think we don't need to make too much introduction. The reason why we're putting all these uh, panelists uh, together for this afternoon is I think one of a kind. As we saw in the past uh, two years, there was a lot of initiative, uh, either from exchanges or from different countries, uh, particularly in the East, uh, launching uh, a new initiative or products. And even from London, uh, some of the initiative is also targeted to the Asian uh, market. So we thought uh, we have this opportunity of putting uh, even of them together in a space of two hours, and we talk about it, and uh, whether we are able to find a commonality among what they are putting up, and at the same time, what are they addressing to opportunity? What kind of opportunity that we are actually looking into? And I'm sure there are common difficulties. I think one, of the key, one major key uh, difficulty is to break the inertia of people who have been very comfortable doing certain things and to move on new things is, I think, uh, one of my mental problems that we all actually face, not only in business but in our in our, in our daily life. Breaking inertia is the most important thing. So I guess we'll hear each, each of the speakers talk about it. Me and, me and uh, Robin Martin is going to co-chair this session. We will be trying to play ping pong. And uh, when I finish, he will be uh, taking up the ball and, 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 and swipe that. So um, without further ado, I'd like to pass it over to Robin. Exchanges all around the world, some of which are represented uh, here today. And I'd like to just provide uh, some perspectives on the exchange landscape and perhaps outline some critical success factors as to what makes uh, exchange initiatives and new products uh, successful. Uh, but let me start off by saying that market infrastructure really is a critical topic. Uh, market infrastructure. Um, plays an important role in ensuring that markets are fair, transparent, and accessible by the broadest range of market participants. Uh, and equally, having appropriate market infrastructure ensures that market participants can trade effectively and with confidence. And as Albert mentioned, right now we're seeing lots of exchanges all around the world launching new products and uh, you know, that's happening in London, that's happening in the US, that's happening in India, in the Middle East, as well as, of course, uh, in this region here. And uh, there are many reasons for this, but I'll summarize just three, which I think are important drivers uh, that explain this phenomenon. One is around regulatory development. Since the great financial crisis of 2007 and 2008, uh, we've seen regulators all around the world trying to push all asset classes, not just commodities and precious metals, but all asset classes towards transparent tra uh, trading venues, such as exchanges. Uh, second, I think we're seeing more and more economies around the world looking to liberalize and formalize their gold markets. That means introducing transparency, stamping out illegal practices, and really, exchanges can be a very, very useful mechanism for driving adherence to standards. And certainly, if you think back to the 90s, uh, when Turkey, the Istanbul uh, Gold Exchange was introduced, or more recently, uh, the Shanghai Gold Exchange in China, these have been uh, very successful examples of that. And then finally, I think we're seeing banks play a less dominant role in intermediating 
uh, the market. We've seen lots of banks exit the precious metals market in recent years. Banks today are more capital constrained, they're more selective about who they do business with, and they're extending fewer credit lines. And that's why exchanges uh, provide some market participants with a very attractive option for accessing wholesale markets directly. So you would think that provides a fantastic backdrop um, for, for, for the panel and their respective firms, but there's also reason, I think, to be cautious. And that's really around the fact that listing new products or setting up a new exchange is something that is very, very difficult. And if you look over the last few decades, the vast majority of new products have failed. Um, and so I think that behooves us to, to really look at what what are the key factors that typically make uh, the introduction of a new exchange or the launch of new products uh, successful? And I'll just summarize what I consider to be uh, four key success factors. One is that any new product needs to solve a real world problem. Uh, now that sounds self-explanatory and obvious, but even today we see far too many cash settled look-alike contracts that aren't introducing something genuinely new into the market. So there needs to be a real market need, um, I think, that is being, being served by, by any new product. Um, second, I think it's really important that any new exchange or product serves a broad range of market participants, that it manages to attract both physical players, refiners, fabricators, producers, banks, as well as financial market participants be it uh, banks as well, funds, speculators, investors, to bring that sort of depth and liquidity to the market. Third, you need to get the product and the operating model right. Again, it sounds obvious, but getting the exact contract specs, the delivery standards, things like member connectivity, getting all those factors in place and making those successful is actually incredibly difficult, even more so for physically deliverable uh, contracts. And then fourth, and this really picks up on Albert's point, and I think perhaps most importantly, it's crucial to get the incentives right. Market participants prefer to kind of wait and see, so I think market infrastructure providers when they're launching a new product really have to think about what is it that is going to compel the market to start trading these products. And financial incentives uh, often go a long way, but are typically insufficient. And so I think it's instrumental that exchanges think about what are the catalysts uh, that can successfully uh, get a market or a new product started. So in summary, I think it's all about generating and attracting uh, liquidity and the uh, six exchange providers will be sharing their plans. But before I hand over to them, I'll ask uh, Philip to give us uh, additional context around the globalization of the gold market uh, as well as some of the trading flows within the ASEAN region, which I think is important context. Philip? Thank you very much, uh, Robin. And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to start by thanking the SBMA for inviting me to speak to you this afternoon and also congratulate the SBMA and Fortel for putting on such a great show here. Um, my topic today is globalization of the gold market, the growing interconnectivity of trade and trading, which is quite a mouthful um, and is really, I think, far more suitable to the topic of some new book on the market rather than a short presentation. But I will try and give you a sort of potted version uh, of what I mean by the title you see in front of you uh, over the next 10 minutes or so. Um, when I started looking at this topic, um, it dawned on me that, in fact, globalization um, not only has been part of the world economy really since the industrial age dawned, um, but specifically for our, it's been pretty much a global market for well over a century. Um, I remember in the early 90s visiting a refiner in Medellin in Colombia, and they very proudly showed me contract which they had from the turn of the century with Johnson Matthey for the delivery of Doré gold uh, to the refinery uh, then I think it was in London. So this is a market where there's been 
a significant degree of integration uh, for a very long time, starting with uh, the financing of production in South Africa, the Americas, um, refining, trading of gold with London uh, at the centre of it all, central banks, of course, and the gold standard, gold being integral to finance uh, up until the First World War. Well, globalisation stalled after the First World War. Uh, we had a period where the gold market became somewhat less international. Uh, trade generally um, collapsed, particularly during the 1930s. But after the Second World War, we started to see the engines of globalisation and trade rev up again. But I think this was constrained by a number of factors. For example, politically, a good part of the world was not integrated in the global economy. The whole communist bloc was outside the Western trading environment. And even within the West, you had regulation really limiting uh, the industry in many ways. For example, in the US, uh, gold holding by individuals was prohibited until December 1975. But besides regulation, I think there were also technological limitations. This was the pre-computer age, the pre-internet age. And it's really, I think, subsequent to that, that we've seen a much faster pace of globalization uh, as we've seen liberalization uh, across the world, economies being brought into the global trading system, a rapid growth, of course, in emerging markets, particularly in this part of the world, uh, financial innovation, which we're hearing a lot about at this conference, and of course, the impact of new technology, which helps it all happen. If we look at just trade for a moment, um, we can see that over the last decade, there's been quite a substantial lift uh, in the volume of trade, shown here as global gold bullion exports. Uh, what I've done here is take the official trade data for exports globally, but I've also added um, derived imports for certain countries like China, Russia, uh, which don't report their export data. What you can see is that there's been a pretty significant rising trend to a peak in 2013 when we had that huge flow of gold to Asia, but that since then things have remained at a pretty high level historically. Now, that's occurred within a context of a world where overall fabrication demand uh, has remained pretty stable over the last 25, 30 years or so. If you look at this picture here, you can see the distribution of just under 2,600 tonnes of fabrication demand in 1989 and 2016, respectively. Note how Europe's share, uh, which in 1989, including the uh, Soviet Union, Americas and Africa, that group of countries, accounted for close to 50% of global fabrication demand. That share has dropped to 23% according to metals Focus data uh, last year. In contrast, you can see how the shares of the Middle East and India, the Indian subcontinent, and Southeast and East Asia, including China, of course, has increased dramatically. Now, that's necess necessitated a pretty substantial flow of bullion from West to East. And a good picture of this comes from the Swiss trade data. Um, note that I have here excluded uh, Swiss exports to the UK which is quite a substantial number, a little, a little less than 500 tonnes last year, for example. But if we just look at the other European trade, uh, trade with the Americas uh, and Africa, and against that, look at the Middle East, the Indian subcontinent, and in red, um, I'm afraid the key seems to be lost here, uh, the trade to East Asia and Southeast Asia, including China, you can see how exports have increasingly been directed towards the principal Asian markets. Now, chief amongst those, of course, has been China. And China's integration 
into the global gold economy uh, has been quite dramatic. And increases in Chinese demand have been such that they've outstripped what's been a pretty impressive increase in mine production and local supply to the market. And that's necessitated, of course, quite a substantial pickup uh, in imports uh, to China. On this graph, you can see um, imports via Hong Kong and also direct imports uh, into mainland China. Uh, direct imports last year coming to close to 470 tons. This in tremendous increase, of course, lies behind much of the shift in the physical business in gold moving from London and Zurich uh, to uh, major Asian centres, principally in this case, of course, Hong Kong, and then on to mainland China, or in some cases direct, of course, into the mainland, as we can see from the dark blue uh, shade uh, of these bars. If, if we look at the, the Chinese market, um, it's interesting to note how supply of gold into China, apparent supply, if we look at China and Hong Kong together in this case, has exceeded demand for the China-Hong Kong market. Now, as an aside, I've decided here to look at China and Hong Kong as one whole, simply to eliminate uh, the rather murky area of uh, cross-border trade between Hong Kong uh, and mainland China, which is not fully reflected in the official uh, trade data. But if you look at Hong Kong and China as a whole, you get this picture for total supply to that unit uh, against fabrication demand uh, in the same. And just to remind you, total supply here, we're looking at mine production, scrap recycling, and net imports into China and Hong Kong. So what's the explanation for this? Well, the explanation is, of course, that there's a substantial amount of bullion that has gone into the country that hasn't necessarily gone into fabrication demand. Um, in this graph, you can see um, cumulative demand for that same China, uh, Hong Kong uh, unit. And you can see that that has actually climbed to around about 10,000 tonnes uh, by the end of last year. Now, a substantial share of that, around 60%, of course, uh, is represented by fabrication demand, principally jewellery. But you can see that there's also about 1,600 tonnes of bar investment in China, cumulatively. And then on top of that, we have close to 3,000 tonnes of other apparent demand for bullion in the China uh, Hong Kong region. Now, that demand, I think, consists of various things. It's a pool of gold, a pool of liquidity, uh, which to some extent is financing, for example, uh, the gold loan business in China, uh, which had grown to over 2,000 tonnes uh, by 2015. Uh, that business has now come down a bit, but we still have a substantial float of gold that's tied up in lending and also in other arbitrage financial activities, and I think also some uh, unrecorded uh, investment in gold in China, Hong Kong. That investment and trading activity, of course, has been reflected in quite a substantial lift in Shanghai Futures Exchange and Shanghai Gold Exchange uh, volumes. Um, for those of you with fairly keen eyesight, uh, you can see uh, in purple on this chart the SGE figures and in red the SHIPE figures um, for turnover on the Shanghai Futures Exchange. And note that I have divided these figures by two to make them comparable to the other exchanges shown here and also to London bullion market clearing volume. So you can see that there's been a significant growth in trading activity in Shanghai, but that it still falls considerably short uh, of trading levels on the COMEX on the one hand, and also what's implied by the clearing volume uh, in London. Now, let's also bear in mind that certainly basis, uh, the relatively limited data that we have, 
that London's actual turnover in the OTC market is significantly higher uh, than the clearing volume shown on this chart. Um, the last time a study was done was in the first quarter of 2011, and at that time it was tenfold uh, the turnover compared to um, the clearing volume uh, going through London. Now, I think another thing to bear in mind here, of course, is that a larger share since 2011 of that turnover in the London OTC market is probably represented by trade related to uh, China and the greater uh, Asian region. Um, a lot of trade is still going to be settled ultimately uh, loco uh, London. I think if we look at the future, um, we've been hearing, and we're going to hear some more detail now in this session, about a number of trading initiatives that I think are going to promote further interconnectivity in the global gold market. Uh, how many of these are going to succeed and how many will die uh, in the sort of Darwinian struggle amongst exchanges and products uh, remains to be seen. But there's a great deal of creativity going on at the moment. Uh, and I think certainly here in Asia, uh, we will see some of the winners. So to conclude, um, I think gold market globalization is certainly well advanced in terms of trade. Um, we see trade growth in terms of absolute volumes and also um, more intensity, I think, of trade uh, within regions. But there still are some um, exceptions. For example, uh, if we look at China, uh, there is officially at least uh, a prohibition on gold bullion exports from the country, a prohibition which certainly helps uh, to um, or allows for certain amounts of arbitrage uh, through Hong Kong and other centres. I will say that the UK and Switzerland are the pivotal physical entrepots, but um, if we look at centres like Dubai, Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, you can see that this um, historic uh, monopoly, if you like, that Switzerland and the UK have had uh, for the source or destination of physical flows, as the sort of terminal markets, if you like, uh, is certainly being challenged uh, by Asia. Domestic gold trading has become liberalised uh, in most countries, but if we look at the situation country by country, there are still a number where currency and capital controls, and of course China is one of these, hinder cross-border activity. And this gives rise, I think, to scope for arbitrage. Uh, where you've got partial gold market liberalisation, you generally have opportunities based on local versus international price or regulatory arbitrage, uh, which allows uh, the nimble uh, to make uh, good money. China clearly is going to be absolutely key to uh, future market development uh, and key to further globalization and integration of markets. And a lot's going to depend upon the Chinese leadership's appetite uh, for further liberalization of the capital account and, of course, the associated internationalization of the RMB. Uh, I don't think that this is just a one-way street. Um, this is not a sort of ideologically driven move to liberalise come what may. Uh, I think there are other considerations and arguments against over rapid uh, liberalisation of the capital account uh, and of the currency in China. And I'm sure that that's, that's very well understood by the leadership uh, in, in that country. I think over the foreseeable future, um, talking about the next five to ten years, uh, London is going to maintain its role as the dominant OTC trading hub, and I think COMEX will remain the largest gold futures market. But they are going to see their lead uh, nibbled away by competitors in Asia, principally, I think, uh, the two Chinese exchanges uh, I mentioned earlier. And also, let's bear in mind that increasingly London uh, is also going to be a venue uh, for the clearing and settlement and trading uh, of activity that originates uh, in this part of the world. Let's take, for example, uh, the statistics that over 40 of the LVMA good delivery refiners are now based in Asia, if we count Russia as well within Asia. 
And we have six Chinese banks, including one as a market maker, ICBC, uh, in London. So I think that clearly we are in a world where gold and trading activity uh, is going to increasingly be focused uh, on Asia, certainly the growth part of it. Uh, but let's not forget that um, London and New York are still absolutely critical to the operation of the OTC and futures market, respectively. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Philip, to give us a high-level overview of uh, what we are talking about this afternoon. I guess nobody will dispute that London and, uh, and, and, and the different market in the U.S. is going to continue to be the main focus of the gold market going forward. But however, as all business, you have to, you have to listen to your customer. You have to listen to where the market flow, the physical flow and the money flow. And I guess this is the reason why we have uh, in the panel various exchanges in Asia talking about the initiative that they are going to put up uh, going forward. And sitting beside me is Dr. Hayden Chen, and he will talk about how he will, he will be, why Hong Kong's uh, sitting just on the fringe of China, and part of China, of course, is uh, taking advantage of the changes of the customer and the uh, advantage of providing a facility to leverage on the big China market with the rest of Asia. Dr. Haywood. Well, I guess first of all, I have to thank uh, Albert for giving us a uh, Chinese gold and silver exchange an opportunity to participate in such a marvelous uh, Asia Pacific Precious Metal Conference. You know, because uh, I think all the work is done is, uh, I think it's amazing, it's fantastic. Uh, to echo with uh, Robin's uh, uh, remarks that exchanges are uh, launching new products to cope with the uh, new era of the gold industry. Uh, today, my topic, I would like to bring today how CGSE is heading towards the enhancement of existing RMB gold contract. We launched this contract uh, back in uh, the year 2011. Okay, it's a RMB denominated kilobar gold contract. Okay, so uh, which will, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the time to come, we'll be bringing efficiency to physical settlement of this contract. Uh, this will be done in you know, the offshore settlement of gold bullion against the offshore RMB and a central voting mechanism. We're going to have, we're going to build a uh, modern warehouse in Shanghai, Shanghai, Shenzhen, Shanghai. Okay. Well, Albert did ask me before, what would be the barrier or the challenge to the success? Why RMB gold settlement and how will we enhance the existing market with offshore RMB where settlement is mainly in US dollars? Well, my answer to him was based on uh, my experience back in the 80s, in fact 1985, when we had the uh, Sino-British negotiation. Hong Kong returns to China. Okay. At that time, our Hong Kong dollar fluctuates and the volatility was fantastic. And uh, at that time, our Hong Kong dollar was so unstable from exchange and from the same trade and also the over overnight interest. Now, audience, that was the time when the CGSE Hong Kong dollar tail bar, Hong Kong dollar denominated tail bars, was extremely active. Now, today, the RMB is commencing her role into international convertibility. It is fluctuative, both in exchange rates and overnight costs, bringing the same opportunity now to traders, the same volatility, just like 30 years ago. 
the arbitrage between international gold market can bring immense trading wealth and avenues, which one can hedge his RMB assets or gold against each other. I can foresee participating to this contract provides traders of the above twofold opportunities. The second dilemma could be the liquidity. Hong Kong has a total RMB, offshore RMB cash deposit of nearly 900 billion, which were very confined to deposit or only small government bonds only. This huge pool, being the largest in the world of, of offshore RMB, would enhance liquidity to gold related financing, channeling this deposit market to practical and efficient cash settlement. As for the physical gold, Hong Kong has been a major transshipment port of China. Annually, around 70, 700 or near close to 1,000 tons per year. This can provide liquidity to the fiscal settlements. With the above two factors, I am very confident that building a central settlement vault would accommodate and facilitate the enhancement of our existing RMB gold contract. And to service the industry from CTSP members, the Asia Pacific region, and even to mainland China market. Singapore is a AAA rated country. Hong Kong to cooperate with Singapore would perfectly build up an efficient corridor from Asia, Eastern Asia to broader Asian market. Now with these remarks, Albert, I sincerely ask yourself and the honorable guests of this panel to open and to contribute to our vision of our exchange. Thank you. If I can next ask um, Wakar Chowdhury, Product Manager for Commodities at ASX, the Australian Securities Exchange, to come up and talk to us about the new product that's being developed by ASX. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, say many thanks to the SBMA and Talbot for inviting us to speak about our products. I certainly can't say I've known you for 20 plus years, but uh, for the time I've known you, you've been very informative and uh, very helpful in the discussions that we've had so far. So, um, first of all, the, the point about this presentation was more to do with disruption or opportunity in the gold markets. Disruption is a very fashionable word to use these days. I just wanted to elaborate a little bit more as to what we think uh, is disruption and what is opportunity. In true sense, a disruption basically makes things difficult for something to occur in its current course. And of course, opportunity is a particular situation that makes it possible to do more things. At the ASX, um, our goal is to create more opportunities because we're a markets infrastructure provider. And given the topic of uh, this panel uh, as to how the markets infrastructure is evolving in this region, we think that creating more opportunities instead of disrupting the current way of doing things is the right way of approaching uh, product development. So we've partnered with uh, a very well-known brand, uh, the Perth Mint. Uh, you will see Perth Mint representatives uh, attending the conference. Um, I'm sure you actually have known the brand for a while. For the exchange, we wanted to partner with an entity to develop a product which delivers uh, what is needed, uh, what is done in the market, and has some inefficiencies that we can actually fix. Uh, clearly, we're not in there to change the way the physical markets uh, behave. Uh, is, that is a way bigger task. We're not a regulator, so we can't put any rules around the physical bullion markets. Um, we're an infrastructure provider, a product provider. And how people use it uh, and how they make use of it within their businesses is up to them. 
and we let the market decide how they progress. So let's talk about Australia for a second. Um, majority of you here would know that uh, Australia is a major player in the international billion market scene. So um, Australia is renowned for um, um, what is known as the economic reserves. So we are number one in the world. Um, uh, and we have about 9,100 metric tons of gold sitting in economic reserves in Australia. Uh, it's not to say that there isn't more, it's just what's actually been proven to be there. Um, we also are the second largest gold producer in the world um, after China. And uh, given the economic reserves and the rate of production, we have resource life of approximately 35 years at this stage. Uh, which is a long way to go, uh, as compared to China, which is expected to uh, expire within the five to seven year period. We also remain uh, the largest net exporter of gold in the world, uh, given that majority of our products actually ends up overseas, primarily in Asia. And that said, we are a major source of gold uh, in the Asia uh, um, trade. And given that we're in the same time zone, uh, a lot of our product actually gets uh, taken into China and India and the Middle East. Um, from a country perspective, uh, we all know that Australia enjoys a stable economy. Um, uh, like Singapore, we've got a very good credit rating of AAA. Um, we are a very safe geopolitical location in terms of access. Um, and we have globally recognized refining and bolting facilities in the country. Uh, in fact, one of the biggest in the world is uh, in Perth, uh, operated by the, uh, by the Perth Mint. Um, and from a taxation perspective, there is no GST on investment grade gold. So, um, as I said earlier, we're, we're an exchange that looks to create opportunities. So, um, I'll take you through a few things we've looked at over the past uh, couple of years to make sure that the product we launch is relevant and useful and has the capability of solving issues in the market. The first thing is, um, based on the regulation that's coming in globally, um, there will be a move uh, for off-market trades or over-the-counter trades, as we call them, uh, into the regulated exchanges. So um, the first thing we've tried to address is that there is no Australian uh, forward curve for the global trade, especially for customers and uh, potential customers of Australian gold to hedge their exposure. So the first thing is that we are offering, uh, for the first time on a regulated exchange, the opportunity to trade uh, a forward price curve. Secondly, because we're such a major physical player in the market as a country, um, the hedge uh, is a lot more accurate if it's actually uh, done at the point of delivery of your product. So uh, Perth is uh, the major uh, accumulation point of uh, physical bullion in Australia. Uh, over 90% of the product that's produced in Australia that is raw product ends up getting um, processed by the Perth Mint. So your hedges are going to be very accurate, uh, especially ex if you're exposed to Australian gold. Um, and given we're an open marketplace, uh, we're connected globally, um, there we see that uh, market participants around the world will be able to take the, the arbitrage opportunity into their trade books as well. Given the similarity of the contracts, and I'll take you through that in a, in a second. Um, the capability of accumulating ahead of delivery, uh, basically what that means is that you could, uh, for your own uh, sale or purchase agreements, you can accumulate at the exchange. Uh, we have a facility with the Perth Mint which will allow you to accumulate gold ahead of time and deliver it as and when you need to in the future. Um, Perth uh, is actually quite connected globally in terms of access. Uh, to product. So you can effectively deliver uh, in Perth after the futures contract delivers and then take delivery in various parts of the world, including London, Shanghai, Hong Kong, Singapore, and even uh, in the Middle East. Now, um, that is, of course, made possible by the infrastructure that Perth Mint operates. The other thing that Perth Mint offer and uh, is a great asset to the Australian bullion market is the ability to 
store safely in Australia. They have uh, the largest um, storage facility in the Southern Hemisphere and uh, they have state-of-the-art vaults and if you take delivery on our futures contract you can convert that into physical and store it um, um, in their vaults. There is also capability to do local swaps through Perth Mint so you can actually move your metal out of Perth after the futures contract is delivered into London and other parts of the world, be it a financial swap or a physical swap, Perth Mint have the capability to do that. And of course, um, if you do not want physical, you can actually cash settle uh, the balance with Perth Mint after you take the futures delivery, making it quite relevant for the financial industry who actually do not want to touch physical metal because of various jurisdictional issues and uh, regulatory pressures. And what's extremely relevant to this region is the capability to get products after a futures contract gets delivered within this time zone. So our partner Perth Mint has the capability to deliver uh, kilo bars, coins, small bars, large bars, and anything in between um, based on your requirement. And the fact is that Perth Mint's refinery and the product that they produce is accredited by the LBMA, SGE, COMEX, TOCOM, and DMCC in Dubai. So the product after delivery um, becomes internationally connected uh, based on the services provided by the Perth Mint. So what is this futures contract? What does it look like? So um, skimming through that table, Basically, it's a monthly contract uh, which allows you to trade 100 ounces per contract. Um, it delivers uh, in Perth at the Perth Mint at the ASX's unallocated accounts. And the expiry is uh, two business days before the third Wednesday of the contract month. Um, the settlement happens within two business days. Uh, the tick size is 10 US cents. And it's an effectively almost 24 hour market. Um, we need a break to settle the products and uh, the banks need to reconcile, so there's a 30 minute break in between. So why do we think this will work? I mean, the panel members before me have actually mentioned that, you know, there's been products that have come in before, there will be products that will come in after, a lot of them fail, in fact 9 out of 10, you know, it's not a real statistic but actually that's what's, that's what's in the market at the moment, um, 9 out of 10 contracts fail. There is no guarantees in life, but uh, what we have tried to do is create um, a partnership which is built on experience and we understand what we're doing. So from an ASX perspective, we've been in the business for over 100 years. Uh, we're accessible globally, you know, we've got a 24-hour market and we're ideally placed within the Asian time zone. Perth Mint, they are a globally recognized precious metals uh, services provider. Um, they are distributing about $18 billion of metal every year. They have 30,000 plus customers uh, globally and they operate uh, state-of-the-art vaults and they are multi-accredited in various jurisdictions. Um, and they are the world's first and the only government guaranteed depository service. They're part of the Western Australian government which is highly uh, rated and, and of course, they have a great online and offline spot market activities as well. Once you actually transact on the futures contract, there are various onward trading services available for you to take advantage of. And these guys have been in the market for over 100 years as well. If you would like to get in touch, um, I suppose Hotel will um, distribute the slides afterwards. Uh, we've got a global network of people um, waiting to hear from our customers. So if you have any questions, please uh, get in touch with us. Um, and I would like to thank again to the panel and to Albert and SBMA for uh, listening to my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, ASX is providing a platform for the Australian producer to access to the global market without just going into a counterparty. It is an exchange platform for local producer. It's again a local solution to an uh, issue which uh, the local producer would like to get a little bit of participation. Next, I would like to call upon uh, Mr. Wawichi uh, Siki to talk about the TOCOM initiative. 
I am honored to take part in this wonderful panel. Uh, Tokong is stepping up our efforts in reaching out to the global precious metals industry. Uh, so we are very pleased uh, to have the opportunity to work together with SBMA this time. Thank you very much. I'd like to briefly cover new developments at Tokong, uh, which we believe adding values to our customers. Uh, these are some basic um, facts about the precious metals market. Uh, Tokom uh, is a commodity exchange uh, listing a wide range of products, including energy, rubber, and agricultural products. Having said that, uh, precious metals market is the largest, occupying 62% of exchange volume. We have four precious metals, but gold is by far the largest, accounting for 45% of exchange volume. Our market is open to international players, and we encourage their participation. As for our gold standard one kilogram contract, 54% of trading originates outside of Japan. Five years ago, it was only about 10%. Uh, so global participation is increasing in our market. In a nutshell, uh, we view ourselves as the most active gold market in Asia, which is open to global players. Okay, talking about the new type of products, we launched what we call Rolling Spot con Futures Contract for gold in May 2015 and for platinum in March of this year. This product is really different from traditional futures products. Uh, generally, futures contract has several contract months, but this Rolling Spot Contract only has one series. Futures has expiry date. Uh, this Rolling Spot technically expires every day, and then automatically rolls over to the next day. This feature enables participants to hold the positions as long as they want, allowing them to execute long-term trading strategies. And why uh, gold and platinum now? Uh, well, uh, here I have a graph uh, with gold and platinum prices since 1984. Historically, the scarcity of and the uh, higher production cost made platinum expensive than gold. But the relationship reversed recently. Uh, because the role of each metal is different, gold as a currency or a safe haven asset, platinum as a metal for industrial use. This situation, where gold is expensive than platinum, has been continued for almost two years. An exchange is not supposed to make any price prediction but some market, market participants, not token but uh, experts in the industry, say that sometime in the future, the price of both metals reverse again, but don't know exactly when. So for those who agree uh, with such views, rolling spot contracts are well suited, for they allow you to hold positions for a long period of time. You can also enjoy capital efficiency by taking advantage of cross margin effects between these parts. So the fact that the rolling spot contract serves the purpose of such trading strategies has a lot to do with the success of the contract so far. Here shows volume and open interest since the launch. You can see light blue on top of each bars, uh, which represent rolling spot contracts. Uh, gold is a monthly uh, figures, and platinum is a daily figures. Gold rolling spot was well received by Japanese retail from the start. This strong showing prompted participation by overseas investors, which now accounts for 30% of volume. As a result, it quickly became a major contract for Tokong. Uh, where it's, it is now the second largest in terms of open interest and third largest in terms of volume. Platinum rolling spot also had a good start, with its first day volume exceeded that of gold rolling spot. For the month of May, the contract ranked fifth for the open interest and sixth for the volume. Uh, it is quite challenging for exchanges to provide new contracts that meet the needs of participants at the right timing, 
uh, especially for many exchanges are coming up with new solutions and alternatives on gold contracts. We believe that uh, we made a certain success with these warnings about contract, not undermining existing contracts, but providing added liquidity to our market participants, allowing them to have a new method to tap into precious metals investment. Okay, in Japan, um, aside, of, aside from futures, we also have commodity ETFs, and they are gaining popularity, especially among retailers who are looking for ways to diversify their portfolio. There exist precious metals ETFs using token prices as a reference price. Mitsubishi UFJ Trust and Banking Corporation is providing such products with their gold ETF's net asset value reaching 50 billion yen and platinum ETF with 12 billion yen. So in general, there is a positive relationship uh, with ETF market and futures market because fund administrators use this futures market to hedge their exposure in their ETF market. So we are encouraging existing commodity ETFs to be successful uh, together with these ETF providers. We are also designing a new precious metals index to be used by these ETF providers. All of Tokom's contracts are denominated in Japanese yen, but there are demands for US dollar denominated gold. Both Japanese yen and gold uh, tends to show a similar movement, for both are regarded as a safe haven assets. So even when database gold prices goes up, it is often offset by Japanese yen appreciation. And as a result, yen-based gold price doesn't change. So no volatility means no trading opportunity or no hedging needs. So we are now thinking about providing US dollar denominated gold index to be used by ETF providers, which will in the end contribute to the growth of Tokens futures market. This shows how we are expanding the scope of precious metals market. Four contracts in the red dot line are our starting point. Physically delivered standard contracts for gold, platinum, silver, and palladium. Then we expanded to cover options contract in 2004, rebound in September of last year. Also, we've been offering mini sized cash settled contracts, minis, and rolling stock contracts. We've also started um, gold physical transaction since July of last year. 100 grams contract settled by the ownership transfer at the designated warehouse, and one kilogram contract settled by a delivery of warehouse receipts. So all in all, we are aiming to provide comprehensive precious metals market, starting with gold and exploring whether it can be applied to other metals, like was the case for rolling spot contract. I think this wraps up my uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Ryoshi. Um, as the World Gold Council guy, I'm particularly pleased that almost 50% of your volumes in some way are, are linked to gold. That's great to see. Uh, next, I'd like to ask uh, Alex Shaw from the London Metal Exchange to come up. Um, Alex and I have actually been working together uh, very closely for the best part of two and a half years on modernizing aspects of the, the London market. Um, and so we'll be hearing more about the upcoming launch of LME Precious. Thank you, Robin. Uh, thank you also to Albert and uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, distinguished co-panelists. Very pleased to be here today, uh, somewhat against doctor's orders, so please excuse me if I have to stop and cough for a little bit. Um, but uh, I will attempt to stick to my uh, allotted uh, eight minutes. So uh, the LME, you, you probably know us as uh, the, the world's largest base metals uh, market uh, and as a center for global price discovery uh, across those base metals. Uh, you, you may also know that we used to provide the uh, London gold and, gold and silver forward curves uh, up until that became uh, unpalatable in, in the regulatory environment uh, for banks to submit those prices. 
Um, and more recently, uh, we, we took on administration of the LBMA Platinum and Palladium prices in December 2014. So now, what is LME Precious? Um, LME Precious is essentially, in the first instance, the launch of a gold contract and a silver contract uh, as exchange-traded futures that are cleared in London. They settle loco London in unallocated bullion uh, in, in exactly the same way as the existing OTC market does currently. Um, we will have, uh, as a key feature, on-screen liquidity from day one, uh, which I can explain uh, further, but that will be on the contract effectively capturing spot trading and future trading out to five years. Launch date is 10th of July. I uh, hope to see you there. Uh, the gold contract is 100 fine troy ounces US dollars. Silver is 5,000 troy ounces, also US dollars. So very familiar uh, structure in many respects. Um, so the, the global bullion market, and, and bringing in mind the, the context of the contracts that we're bringing to the market, um, as we all know, I think, the, the, the bullion market is a global market. It has many centres and areas of focus, um, but London has operated as that key focal point uh, for OTC trading, and indeed the estimates of total trading in that market do vary uh, to, some, to some wide degree, as, as Philip referenced, uh, it's, it's many times over the reported cleared figure, uh, somewhere between perhaps uh, 500,000 uh, and 1.5 and million tonnes um, traded OTC. Um, now, we see that a key, a key part of the role of, of London is, is being that liquidity centre uh, for trading and the ability to make that interoperable and to transact and connect with other uh, regional markets and to provide that uh, liquidity pool and access. Uh, but that said, the London market has seen a considerable degree of change in recent years. Um, it, it is quintessentially and always has been an OTC market, people trading bilaterally, uh, no exchange in, in the middle, no clearing house providing uh, clearing services to de-risk that market. But it is now a market that's undergoing considerable and profound regulatory change. I, I, will, I will try to avoid boring you all by, by going into too much detail as to the plethora of initiatives that are underway concurrently, many of which come fully into force in, in 2018, but uh, suffice to say the combination of these regulatory changes have a, a significant impact on the uh, operating and business models of the banks, particularly when they look at their capital and leverage ratio side. So they will see, and they have seen, a considerable increase in the cost of capital for doing business for clients and trading OTC, and particularly uh, also therefore around the cost of trading non-cleared OTC derivatives. We've seen a n number of large players leave the market and there is increased pressure on uh, credit lines and providing those to clients and operating bilaterally, which will increasingly require margining in any case. Um, all, all of this uh, points to the, the need for uh, a liquid trading venue that can provide multilateral netting efficiencies and offers the security uh, and practicality of central clearing. So to explain how the LME Precious Initiative has come together over the last, uh, I, think, I think Robin's right, two and a half years or so, um, we have uh, been very fortunate to work with a number of parties who have a commitment to making this uh, succeed and to investing in the success of a London-based uh, exchange-traded and cleared forum. Um, but this has also given us the benefit of, uh, of guidance around contract design, specifications, extensive engagement with uh, the wider market as well around how to ensure that what we bring to market fits the market and provides the required functionality. It effectively, key to our brief became uh, the ability to really uh, crystallise and capitalise on the, the spot liquidity which is the focal point of the London market but to make that sort of interoperable with the futures um, as well. And part of that is by providing tradable calendar spreads, such as an EFP, whereby it's uh, extremely easy to trade spot and then effectively trade that position forward into uh, a given month by uh, executing a price that is the calendar spread cost. 
um, make it very easy to arb against other existing markets. Now, clearly there is key liquidity in, in the US and uh, also I think as, as, as Waka referenced, um, a 100 ounce contract is, is e very easy to arb, a 5,000 ounce silver contract is very easy to arb with existing pools of liquidity. And that in itself provides risk offset benefits uh, for participants, but also that additional enticement to trade uh, for other uh, particularly arbitrage focused players. Um, another key part of what we were told and looking to bring to market was around um, providing uh, continuous um, pricing uh, along the curve through the trading day and at a, a meaningful level of depth um, so that real volume can be transacted uh, on a futures basis, not just out to a few months or not just leveraging the, the, um, the liquidity in the very near term, but actually uh, facilitating trading and, and transparency of pricing all the way out to three, four, five years. Finally, um, we, we understood it was very important uh, to, to work with the London market to provide both an on-screen lit um, order book, but also to, for, to be highly facilitative to the existing uh, bilateral ne negotiated phone broked market. And so we, we provide effectively two venues in, in like fashion to our base metals market to a large extent, where it's very easy to execute trades bilaterally and then book them onto the contract and therefore they go through clearing and delivery in the same fashion. So just to try and explain uh, how, how the trading of LME precious contracts works, uh, the, the LME and LME clear are the exchange trading venue and clearing house, which uh, effectively um, the LME providing the member interface, uh, but also uh, providing an interface to, to the wider market through, through ISVs but then settling into the local London existing infrastructure uh, for unallocated bullion. We, we are a member-based organisation uh, in, in terms of access, uh, no longer ownership, um, but uh, clearing members um, will effectively have the opportunity to join as a precious metals only clearing member or as a full exchange member. Uh, they will have to make a default fund contribution in order to be a full clearing member participant. Um, but we, we provide a very easy access route for non-clearing members who would not have any joining fees and can access uh, house-level trading fees. Uh, I've got 50 cents on here per, per traded and cleared contract, but uh, that, that can be as low as, as 30 cents depending on what contract and how they're trading it. Um, clearly not everyone's going to be a member. The general market can access um, through uh, a, a not large number of clearers uh, and also non-clearing members who will be announcing uh, as we move through to launch July 10th. But to mention the clearing members we can talk about today, uh, we're very fortunate to have Goldman Sachs, ICBC Standard Bank, Morgan Stanley, Natixis, and Societe Generale uh, in, embedded in, in making this a success and providing clearing. Additionally, we've been joined by uh, Bank of China or Boki Global Commodities, Commerce Bank, Macquarie, Marex, and Sokgen New Edge or Sokgen International, uh, who will also look to provide clearing services. Um, this, this is the initial list that we can talk about. Um, we have uh, quite a few others in the pipeline, uh, but, but if, if you are interested to trade, uh, any, any one of those entities can provide an access route. So then just to, to try to tie this back, if, it, if it's not already implicit, to the significance for the Asian market, um, this, this market will be available on screen from 8 a.m. Singapore time. Um, it, it is the focal point for the local London liquidity, we feel, and uh, it'll provide on screen pricing, spot and forward out to five years. Um, key features uh, around this being an exchange traded and cleared contract are clearly the transparency, the compliance with regulation. We can trade report all positions, um, make it very, very easy to transact and be compliant with multi-jurisdictional regulatory obligations. Um, this in, is in part, uh, but overall the whole pricing model means it's a very cost-effective way to access uh, the biggest liquidity pool in the world. Um, the, the fact that it is cleared enables uh, participants to do away with some of those bilateral credit lines 
which I think we believe uh, we, will, we will see a dwindling of in current years uh, as the cost to have those capital or credit lines in place uh, becomes considerably higher for banks and they, they choose their client base very much more carefully and consolidate that down. Um, we also have the ability to, to bring on trades and executors uh, and introducing broker, uh, providing uh, counterparties uh, connectivity and then allowing them to book on trades to the exchange. And in that way, we, we believe it is a very uh, accessible market. And that, uh, that is all I wanted to say. I think I kept to my, my allotted time. Um, thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, the distinguished panel. So, certainly, uh, LME purchase is a well thought out uh, idea and, and, and new initiative. And we are hoping that you have a successful launch uh, coming up in July. Next, I would like to call upon uh, Dr. Win Chai Chat. Chakon Pit Pai uh, to talk about the TFEX initi initiative. Probably uh, among all the Asian exchanges other than uh, Tokong and Shanghai Go Exchange and Shanghai Future Exchange, TFEX is the most active exchanges in Go contract and has indeed trading volume. And we'd like you to talk about your initiative, new initiative. Thank you so much, Albert, for your kind introduction. And once again, thank you for giving me the opportunity to join the, uh, the conference and participate in this panel. Well, today, um, what I will do is basically um, give you a little bit of idea of the gold landscaping in Thailand, and then talking about the gold futures and the thing that you've explained uh, for uh, the next coming initiative. First of all, uh, for Thai people, um, Everyone like I think everyone loves gold. So as the you know others people in Asian country, I think it, it, even even you know uh, when you're born in Thailand, when you're small, so small, everyone will say, tell you to save you know by buying some gold. So basically, the gold was uh, perceived as very precious, you know, and you know in terms of uh, tools for saving for Thai people, the big market in Thailand is the pure gold jewelry. So basically, it's necklace, uh, bracelets for gold. That has been happened for a long time, you know, more than 20 years, and it's still being a very big market in Thailand. We have like a 70, uh, uh, 7,500 goldsmith shop around the country which sells the gold, uh, pure gold jewelry. I think in the last 10 years, the uh, investment has become, has changed. People try to, uh, and basically, are more popular to buy gold bars and trading gold bar. In Thailand, the gold unit, uh, the, the, the purity is different. We have all, all local unit, which is called baht, but it's not Thai baht, it's baht, which is uh, equivalent to 15.244 grams, and purity is 96.5, and price was fixed by Gold Trader Association. And as a result of our popularity in gold, Thailand was amongst one of the you know, uh, top 10 gold importers. The, in Thailand, basically, it's a different from other countries because the bank is not the major gold trader and participant in the gold industry. At present, uh, Thailand Future Chain offers two gold contracts and the trading volumes, we are, we are a small exchange, so basically the volumes around it's about 2.9 uh, million contract in 2000, uh, 2016. The gold, the gold future contract has been introduced in Thailand for 10 years. Um, it's, I think it's a, about the same age as the exchange. So basically, the future exchange is new to Thai people and also, also the gold future as well. We have introduced the first contract, the 50 baht gold contract. And with the introduction of the gold contracts, we have a big four bullion house to be our trading members and also the, uh, the brokers member as well. So after we introduced the uh, 50 baht gold future contract, we uh, introduced another gold contract, 
which is a 10 baht gold future contract. And then we have further developments, which we extend trading hours from um, 4.45 to 10.30 at night. At present, we, the goals that we have basically is a castle settle contract against LBMA prices. The, the gold contract, the gold future contract basically is 96.5 in terms of purity. And basically because we are retail dominate con uh, market. So basically the gold size is trying to be popular for a smaller size contract. And the contracts month, we have a three nearest even month. The trading volumes uh, at present is, is around like 10,000 10, contract per day on average. And as a, if we break down in terms of participant, we'll see that TFX basically is a retail market. 55% of the whole product of the whole market is, is retail participant. So as the goals, goals future as well, in goals product, 47% is local investor and 45% is local institution. When I say local institution, I mean uh, market maker, go trader, um, members, pop tradings. But when I say local uh, investor, we mean um, retail, local retail, and also the goldsmith shop, which you know becomes an uh, investor. That will be considered as retail investor as well. So basically, it's a balance mix between local investor and local institution, and we have foreigner about 8%. The thing is, the contract is still trading in bar, trade and settle in bar, record in bar, and we settle in bar. We also, uh, in terms of trading, we are about 50% in day trading and night trading. One of the reasons that the foreign investor uh, participate in the gold products in Thailand, basically they are looking for trading, uh, directional trading and arbitrage opportunity. In, in, in the slides, basically the goals, it just show that you know, we convert the price of goals in Thai baht using the fixing as this, at the end of the day and also use the settlement price at the end of the day. You will see the correlation with the, the global gold price. But given today, intraday, we will see um, the changes of the price, even though it's correlated with the global price, global price there is still some arbitrage opportunity. There is a, some, some study offered by a professor in Thomas University which indicate that basically the uh, new exchange like TFEX, the, there is some uh, arbitrage opportunity because the intraday price, the, the speed of chain which we adjust to the global price, there's still some room for arbitrage opportunity, which is the same for other news exchanges. For the upcoming developments, um, we have been uh, looking for the extended night trading session because we understand that oh, when we, you know, we are in different time zones to major market and the gold trading is very um, heavily traded at night. At present, we are um, closing the market at 10.30 p.m which is the time that the market is, you know, start to get going. So basically we would like to extend it for the first phase until five minutes before midnight. That is technical difficulty in terms of the extending to 24-7. Uh, so basically the first phase, we are extended the gold trading out to um, five minutes before midnight so that we have more overlapping time with the major changes. And the next one, we're going to introduce the gold D contract, which Basically, um, we, if we just give you a little bit of background, uh, two or three years ago, we are looking for, like, um, with the participant from the Gold Traders Association to create a gold exchange. But we have looking for different models, which is we cost efficient and more effective and have us excellent infrastructures. So finally, we thought that we already have TFEX and all the gold, major gold participants already the gold member. So what we come up is to basically to develop a new product that we can trade based on existing infrastructure, but being able to accommodate the need of the market. So we come up with the Goldie contract. Goldie contract basically, if we ask what it is, is basically um, 
a spot deferred contract, but we put it in the futures framework. So basically, you, if you buy the Goji, it codes as a spot contract. And you have to deliver, you have the option whether you will deliver the goals at the end of the day. If not, basically you pay the interest to defer it until, you know, whenever you want. But at the expire of the contract, because it's in the future framework, you have to physically settle. So basically it's a physical settle contract in the framework of futures. Um, the contract size is 100 gram. It's a quite a small size, but if you want to take a deliver, you have to have at least 10 contracts. So we deliver one kilowatt contract. If you ask me why we developed that contract with the um, rationale that we gave you, but we we'll see that uh, in terms of product, it has uh, several you know, um, highlights. The first one is it accommodates hedging and trading very well. You could see that the first contract, the, the first couple contract we introduced, basically it is in Thai baht. So it involves to common and the movement in gold price as well as the movement in exchange rate. So basically, if you want to the people to understand more, like uh, for the local people, basically to look at the movement in, in the market, the global market, and be able to, to trade very efficient. So basically, we use it as a US dollar code, right? So basically, otherwise, somehow uh, Thai baht could be against the, the gold price. So gold, gold price wouldn't move in Thai baht, while the uh, global uh, US dollar price has been moved a lot. So that was one of the advantage in terms of trading because it's allowed more movement to coordinate with the, the global market. And the second thing is, Basically, it's allowed um, because it's in the same infrastructure of TFEX. In terms of investor, yes, use the same account. Basically, they put the same margin, manage the margin very efficient. And the third one, basically, is facilitate the people who want to hedging, for uh, for for who, who want to saving. As I previously mentioned, that people love to have gold to save gold. At present, they could buy from the gold dealer and keep it at the safe at the bank or keep it with the gold dealer. But the thing is, that is the credit, you know, it's the credit, uh, it's the credit between uh, and the trust between the gold dealer and uh, the investor. But once we put it on the chain, what we can, that would strengthening, that was strengthening the credit risk uh, and the trust of people because it's the collectively, uh, of the gold dealer plus the exchange and current house system that put in place. And that, that, is, um, that is the thing that we think that the, the, gold, the, the gold deal has to offer. In addition to that, um, what we want to do basically in this gold deal contract, we want to, uh, we have to consult with the uh, participant to basically develop the market. As I told you that we have the 96.5, what we want to do is to develop the gold market further. So basically, the delivery unit here is a one kilo bar with the LBMA, some designated LBMA brand that we select, which we select from the popularity of that in Thailand as well. And the last thing that we think that um, is very interesting is the GoD contract has been supported by our major participant, which is the member who is our gold dealer and our gold future as well, or gold future member as well. So, as though, so the supporting in terms of to be market maker and also be the market maker in physical as well as futures. I think it's my time is up. So it's eight minutes. <laughs> well, thank you for that. I think it's fascinating to see how many retail investors apparently are spending their evenings trading gold. Um, I absolutely think that's a great use of their time and I also think the storage costs uh, on, on the roll contracts are pretty amazing so hopefully that's something we can discuss uh, further. Uh, next up we have uh, Sunil Kashyap who as you know is SPMA chairman but also head of Asia at Scotia and he'll be talking to us about Singapore as a trading and uh, custody hub uh, for precious metals. Thank you. So as I say, this is uh, something totally different. Uh, I think over the last uh, hour and a half, we've had to tour around the world from Hong Kong to Australia to Tokyo to London to, to Thailand. Uh, so you're back home now in Singapore. 
Um, and what I'm going to be talking about is not really an exchange, but just uh, a, a value proposition uh, for Singapore um, as a safe haven, uh, and specifically talking about Singapore as a safe haven for storing gold. So trading takes place around the world, uh, but at the end, people, uh, long-term investors want to store gold in physical form, uh, and our proposal is that they should consider Singapore as a, a location. Uh, and uh, my presentation will explain a little bit about um, what Singapore has to offer. This is a slide which uh, was covered earlier today in terms of the ecosystem uh, in the precious metals industry in Singapore. Uh, we really have, uh, we're, uh, we're quite, uh, I think, uh, lucky to have the right ecosystem in terms of the bullion banks, the logistics companies, um, the, uh, the refineries over here, the storage facilities, etc. Um, so Singapore has the right infrastructure in place uh, for the precious metals industry. So what does it mean for physical gold investors? So this is specifically, uh, by this we mean uh, people who hold physical gold for a medium to long term um, and are looking for the cheapest way or the easiest and safest way to, to store uh, gold uh, in safe custody. Uh, this may cover uh, retail investors, high net worth individuals. Uh, it may also cover institutional investors uh, like pension funds or hedge funds uh, and also central banks. Central banks typically uh, keep their gold in um, uh, with Bank of England or with the Fed or with BIS uh, and what we want to uh, perhaps look at is, is an alternative location for them uh, in Singapore. So this, this whole area of uh, investors basically uh, what we're suggesting to them is Singapore can offer a place where you can buy physical gold, you can store it, uh, you can lend it perhaps uh, and uh, you can uh, sell that gold eventually when you want to liquidate your holdings. Why Singapore? Well, um, specifically for the regional players, uh, the proximity, you know, rather than looking at holding gold in Zurich or Geneva, um, we feel that there is a, a need for people to have metal close by. Uh, so whether it's uh, investors in, in China, uh, or institutional investors in, in Hong Kong, uh, they may have a need to store gold and we're just two or three hours away. Similarly, there may be investors in, in the neighboring country, ASEAN countries um, who may have accounts in Switzerland uh, who would, should consider Singapore as, as, as a location because it's close, you, you can be close to where your gold is. Uh, secondly, as has been mentioned earlier, uh, Singapore is economically uh, probably the most secure country in the region and, and certainly amongst the top five in the world. Um, so that offers the financial security that you need, that your gold is in a country which is financially safe. Uh, moreover, from a political stance, I think Singapore is quite attractive. Uh, today, early today, John talked about the turbulence uh, occurring specifically in the political spheres uh, and there are different uh, groups and factions being uh, created now in the political uh, environment. In that kind of situation, you need a country which is politically stable and neutral, um, which is not aligned within one group or one block or another. Uh, and Singapore certainly offers that attraction. Um, also, What's available in Singapore is a very sophisticated um, and diverse financial infrastructure. Most of the private banks in the world have offices here in Singapore. You've got very strong local banks. Um, I think three banks which are rated AAA uh, in the world and offer uh, the modern services, the access, the availability of products that you may need. Uh, and as a counterparty, you can uh, deal with them and use them uh, as a way to store your gold over here. Lastly, uh, the legal system. Uh, the legal system in, uh, in Singapore offers you 
uh, absolutely uh, top um, top grade world class um, comfort in terms of recourse, in terms of arbitration, etc. And so, when you're dealing with a counterparty as per Singapore law, you can be comfortable that uh, it abides by the highest legal standards in the world. So, in terms of the infrastructure, um, what what does an investor require um, besides the uh, the the, the the conditions I mentioned earlier? Uh, I think that's what I would just like to cover right now. In terms of uh, logistics, um, with the availability at the Freeport and other private uh, security houses, uh, there are there is ample space uh, for storage of precious metals. Very high quality uh, storage space available in Singapore. There's an active interbank uh, physical market. Uh, most of the bullion banks have bullion desks uh, in Singapore, so you can trade uh, with them and you can get delivery of physical metal here. And the counterparties you're dealing with are some of the most highly rated counterparties. So you can be, uh, you can, you have a choice of counterparties, you have the availability of storage uh, facilities, and eventually something we would like to look at uh, for the large institutional investors or maybe for central banks is to set up a quasi-government agency which can act as a counterparty very much similar to a BIS uh, in, uh, for, for the Asian context. So these kinds of, um, uh, these kinds of uh, prerequisites which uh, an investor may require uh, to buy gold, to store gold in uh, a secure location, which they may probably be doing in a place like Switzerland right now, um, are the kinds of facilities that are available in Singapore and we certainly look at Singapore as being an alter alternative Asian uh, hub for storing physical gold from an investment point of view. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Sunil. I, I think uh, one have to start looking into seeing or, or, or assessing whether they should have some gold store in Singapore, either individually or, or a, a corporate type network, or even sovereign wealth, or even sovereign country. I think this is a ideal place for you to have your gold store in Asia. If you have, you have to choose a place, certainly Singapore is a, is a consideration. Well, uh, Asian, China, Chinese and, and Indian has been, or even Southeast Asia people, has been buying gold for many uh, thousand years. And I mean, everybody loves gold culturally and religiously. But Asian market really actually takes when China get moved into this business about 13, 14 years ago. And Shanghai Gold Exchange is one of the key driver in modernizing the or or bring it up to speed to, 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 to deal with global market when Shanghai Gold Exchange started operation in 2002. And now China is one of the biggest market in the world. And, uh, but China or Shanghai Gold Exchange would, lo would not be just storing there. They also have lots of new initiatives. My good friend, Andrew Webb, who actually has championed and worked together with his colleague to bring together this Shanghai Bank Club, which he like to share with you. And this, in times to come, will be a very respectable price uh, benchmarking for the gold market in currently in China, and hopefully it will become a benchmarking for Asia and the world. Uh, uh, thanks a lot for Albert's uh, good words about the media about Shanghai Global Exchange. Uh, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, really, time again, I'm grateful uh, to Albert, my, and also uh, Sun Liu, uh, the chairman of the SBMA, uh, Singapore Bullion Market Association. Uh, these two gentlemen uh, are my uh, decades long friends. They uh, uh, taught me and uh, have been teaching me for many, many years. Uh, 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 thanks a lot. 
for giving me to, uh, this chance to uh, speak about new deals of uh, uh, benchmark price. Uh, this photo, uh, uh, anyway, uh, one year ago, uh, on April 19, uh, 2016, to be exact, uh, our Shanghai Gold Exchange launched the uh, Shanghai Gold Benchmark Price Trading. Uh, uh, this photo uh, shows uh, our chairman, Mr. Zhao, declare the uh, starting of the trading. Uh, that day, around 800 uh, professionals in the Bonnie industry waiting with uh, 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 the opening, the first trade uh, down there. Uh, uh, those gentlemen they're here, including uh, uh, Shonil, uh, our advisor, international advisor to the exchange, and also central bankers and uh, Chinese government officials. Uh, I, I take the photo here to show how Chinese China pay tremendous attention to this new initiative. Uh, 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 we're talking about uh, Shanghai Gold here. Uh, we uh, uh, do the benchmark. It is about kilo gold bars uh, with uh, uh, four nines uh, purity. Uh, uh, gold content 99.99% or higher. We code it in RMB, Chinese currency, per gram. Uh, its delivery uh, on T plus two basis, uh, we trade it uh, twice a day, 10.15 uh, uh, in the morning and 2.15 uh, uh, in the afternoon, Beijing time. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, Beijing time is the same as uh, that of Singapore time. Uh, up to now, uh, the trading volume uh, uh, in 19, uh, uh, last year anyway, uh, is 3.29 tons. Uh, the daily average trading volume for this year till May uh, 18 uh, uh, is uh, 3.71 tons. I checked my uh, email, email just now. Uh, uh, this, uh, today's afternoon, uh, the training volume uh, is around uh, 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 a little bit more than three times. We traded uh, seven rounds this afternoon. Uh, last uh, Thursday, we traded uh, 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 20 rounds. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, the volume uh, 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 increasing uh, week by week there. So uh, uh, the next is uh, uh, how we do it. Generally speaking, uh, uh, we have uh, 10 steps uh, for the uh, uh, benchmark price trading. I could not go into details. You may uh, spend uh, uh, quite a few hours to talk about it. Uh, I just uh, uh, focused on three uh, aspects. Uh, the first one is uh, we have about, uh, anyway, we from the, we have a, a reference price submission, uh, initial price announcement, trading, clearing, and settlement. Uh, for the uh, reference price uh, 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 step, we have uh, 18 uh, reference price providers including uh, British Stand Chart Bank, uh, Austria, Austria uh, ANZ Bank, uh, Swiss MKS uh, Corporation, uh, Bank of China, Hong Kong, and uh, top Chinese commercial banks, including ICBC, BOC, ABC, all the big names, and uh, 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 the largest gold producer, the gold refining smelters, and uh, gold fabricators, uh, 18 altogether. Uh, they provide uh, the uh, reference for, uh, for us uh, before the starting of the benchmark trading. 
we exclude or meet uh, the highest one, the highest uh, reference price, and the lowest reference price, and use the mathematic average of the remaining 16 prices as our uh, initial price for the first round of trading. Uh, and then the second thing I would like to stress is uh, the trading. Every member and their corporate clients can join the trading. I mean, uh, all the uh, uh, SGE members, not only this uh, 18 uh, uh, banks or big ones, uh, this is open uh, to everybody. And then uh, the third thing I would like to uh, 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 point out is uh, Shanghai Gold Exchange provide a central settlement, a central clearing. And that means our SGE is a central counterparty for all the trains. CSP here. This is uh, quite different from uh, uh, what has been done uh, in London uh, 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 for the OTC trading, or even the, uh, uh, the past gold fixing. Even now, there's a benchmark trading. Uh, uh, they are still uh, on OTC basis. Uh, uh, we, we would like to say uh, the trading there, the benchmark trading is quite transparent, and uh, 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 this is a, a, a screen brace a trading platform for the trader uh, uh, of the uh, exchange. So the reason why we do it, just uh, 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 mentioned what Robin with uh, work of council said. We have to solve some problem. Uh, China has been the largest gold producer, the largest gold consumer, and the largest gold importer, at the same time, one of the top gold investors. The local market there, we need a tradable, fair, transparent price. So that's the main reason. Uh, what's our expectations here? We have uh, Four main exportation goals, targets in our minds. We would like to, have to see active participation uh, in the trading from both inside and outside of China, first one. The second one is we would like uh, the local market use our benchmark price for the fiscal trading and uh, uh, China's fiscal gold import and export. The third target is uh, we would like uh, uh, the gold, the liquid trading, and the investment there in China use our benchmark price as our reference price. The last one, in our, in our mind, we would like someday in the future uh, the benchmark price, gold benchmark price in RMB could become as one of the global reference price. In addition to the uh, benchmark price in US dollar exclusively only. Uh, I would like to mention uh, what our chairman said. The bullion world has been looking at the east now, but we are looking for the future. I wish a bright future for FBMA for Singapore Bullion Market Association, and for all of your guys. Thank you very much. There's a question for Wakfa that uh, knowing that uh, the mining in the, the mining uh, producer or producer are all priced in Australian dollars, and uh, your contract is denominated in US dollars and not in Australian dollars, why don't you actually make a better apple to apple, full head for them, price your contract in Australian dollar and US dollar? That's the question. Thank you for the question. Uh, we did consider an Australian product, an Australian dollar product. Um, we need liquidity in futures products, that's the start. Um, if we were launching an OTC contract, uh, which wasn't uh, available on a lit screen, then yeah, Australian dollar contract would have made sense. Um, 
correct that mining companies in Australia do have a transaction in Australian dollars. However, if you look at their hedge leg, that mm. is done in US dollars through a bank. Thank you. Primarily. Yes. Thank you. Well, before I ask the second question, I mean, uh, we welcome questions from the floor. You can either write in the piece of paper which we provide you or raise your hand, maybe we give you, we'll, we'll pass the mic to you. Uh, the second question here is for Sunil. I mean, this is uh, some market information. So what is the average leasing rate for gold? <laughs> Depending if you're borrowing or lending. <laughs> Depending. So it's, it's uh, like buying fish. You have to see how big is the fish, how fresh is it, and uh, who are buying this. All right, there's no that's, answer. That's the answer. <laughs> Thank you. Seasonal price. Seasonal price. OK, anybody like to ask questions, or Robin, you want to take over? Let me ask Philip a question because he's been sitting very patiently here next to me. So Philip, uh, you, you don't have a particular horse in the race. You're probably looking at this agnostically. How do you view these developments, all these contracts being listed, competing exchanges? Is this good for the market overall? Is there a risk that it just fragments liquidity? Or are these solutions solving for particular needs in particular markets? Um, well, I think first of all, choice is a good thing. Innovation is a good thing. Um, but having said that, um, only so many can survive. And I, th I think I might have used the word Darwinian uh, during my presentation. And I think that's an adequate word to describe the process that will probably take place, which is basically, I think, it's unlikely to see fragmentation. Rather, we will see what we've seen in the past with unsuccessful contract launches that they basically come and go. So there, there will be winners and losers. Um, which horse one should bet on, I think that's a tough call. Um, there's always an incumbent advantage, particularly if you look at the largest incumbents I mentioned in my presentations, but, but some of the products and contracts that, that are being offered here uh, have a very strong uh, rationale and are backed by some very strong players. Um, without mentioning any names. Uh, but, and I, I therefore think we will see change. Uh, and I think the drift from OTC to exchange is definitely going to be a theme. Uh, and that is going to, I think, lead to some degree of market disruption. But uh, I don't think we see, I don't think market fragmentation is, is the term. Rather, that we will see one or two new entrants who will grab uh, market share. Thanks. OK, so to spin the analogy further, different horses. Um, it's people like Sunil who place the bets on the horses, isn't it? And without having to comment on any of the particular exchanges, Sunil, if you could give us uh, a bit of color around how a bank like yours uh, evaluates different exchange traded offerings and sort of what it takes for a bank like yours to then actually commit to, to an exchange. So I think, you know, we have the benefit um, of choice, so as Philip said. Uh, but ultimately, banks are basically facilitators. So what we do is, is do what our customers require. So at the end of the day, I think it's going to be driven by uh, where customers feel more comfortable to trade. And wherever the liquidity goes, there will be two things. One is we guide the liquidity towards that, that particular venue. And the second thing is, in order to facilitate um, liquidity uh, later on in terms of illiquid periods, we would step in and, and, and provide um, provide our own bank's liquidity to ensure that the gaps are taking place. But it's really driven by, that gaps are removed, but it's really driven by where the customers want to go in the first case. And then the bank follows in, you know, for arbitrage purposes or just for filling in uh, liquidity gaps, the bank will come. Thanks. Um, maybe Alex, if you want to pick up on that, is that what you've seen in your discussions with banks, brokers, and potential end clients? Is it very much uh, sort of client-led push onto, onto the venue? Yeah, I, I have to agree very much with Sunil that, that uh, I, I think um, for, for any exchange rate contract to work and be successful, there has to be a core uh, base of liquidity and demand. Uh, from the clients who want to transact there, and it, uh, that, you know, as, as they say, liquidity breeds liquidity. Um, and uh, you know, that was top of mind for, for the LME when we were looking at what to do with precious metals over the last couple of years. Was 
very much recognizing that uh, it's all very well to write up a contract spec and then put that out there and see what happens. Um, but uh, very much more compelling is, is bringing together a, uh, a body of parties who can guarantee some of that on-screen liquidity uh, from the get-go. And that's, that's very much why we are quite confident at this point uh, that uh, come July 10th we'll have uh, screens with prices on and we will have uh, a decent amount of liquidity on the platform from committed partners before then attracting uh, others from the rest of the market. Robin, I mean, the, Philip talked about choices and Sunil talked about choices as well. Basically, it's customer choice and then we react to customers. So, uh, with various initiatives, uh, we are talking about cannibalization. Cannibalization between products, exchanges, and also cannibalization if exchanges offer more than one contract. And among uh, our speaker, two exchanges, TPEX and TOCOM, they have existing gold contract and they continue to roll out new contract. Is it going to, has it been cannibalizing your existing volume of, of customer or you are offering new, uh, new dimension to attract new customer? Maybe both of you can address this. In the case of Tokong, I think that the uh, introduction of the new product, uh, we, uh, we uh, our focus was to reach out to the uh, Japanese retail investors, or else, you know, the existing contract is con uh, consists of uh, not just the retail, but the proprietary training firms, HFTs, training companies. And so, so it's a new customer. So it's a new customer. So yeah. we believe that uh, we have yeah. added new liquidity to the market yeah. uh, with the introduction. So Dr. Win Chai, you have the same idea? Yeah, actually for launching the new products, we always look at you know, some ways to actually the, to tap the new market that we have not tapped yet. So we're looking and learning from the past present you know, to see whether uh, we could introduce new contracts. But the thing is, when we talk to some investors, once the one contract have, has liberty, it always draws the liquidity for the new contract. If you look at my slide, the 50 bar uh, mm. gold futures has not much liquidity, but when the 10 bar contract took off, the feedback I got is maybe we could improve to get the you know to get the volume more for the market maker for the bigger contract okay. because they're interested to trade the new contract. So I think you know the thing is to get it going. Yeah. I see. Okay, maybe to switch gears a little bit, we've been talking, I guess, about competition, uh, but uh, some of you I know also quite notably have partnerships with other exchanges. Uh, in particular, the Shanghai Gold Exchange has signed lots of memorandums of understandings, various corporations, uh, CGSE as well. Uh, so perhaps, Andrew and Haywood, if I could ask you to comment on sort of the role of partnerships and whether that's uh, kind of an important aspect of where you're taking your business. So uh, you asked about uh, uh, cooperation among uh, different exchanges. Yeah. Uh, 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 whenever I'm talking about this kind of topic, I always uh, 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 thought about something, just like football or tap tennis. You see, uh, Chinese are very good at tap tennis. Uh, every time they win, the champion. Uh, then as time pass on, nobody play with you. So you are playing by yourself. Uh, uh, so uh, just same like football. Uh, British guys are good at uh, football. You say not encourage guys in Asia, in Africa, in Latin America to play it. So uh, slowly, maybe there will be no more football in the in the future sometime. <laughs> That's a basic concept. We just support each other. Uh, uh, we would like other exchanges, for example, uh, uh, use our benchmark price, gold, in RB, as a benchmark, as a, how to say, settlement price or clean for to launch their own future contracts. Anyway, we would like to support each other, uh, 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 not compete with each other only. Thanks. I agree with it, really. <laughs> because uh, I think I think we ought to have we ought to have friendly friendly competition. You know what I mean? That's why that's why I think Shanghai Connect with Hong Kong, uh, Shang, yeah. uh, uh, Shanghai Hong Kong Connect 
and then later on, maybe Shanghai, they have Shanghai Dubai Connect, and then Hong Kong, we have Hong Kong Dubai Connect, we have Hong Kong Singapore Connect, and then Hong Kong Shenzhen Connect, and all this is a, is a, is a macro, is a macro vision, or a macro mission, okay, because all this connect along this uh, uh, Belt and Road, okay, uh, road map, okay, this, along this uh, uh, physical gold corridor, okay, I think we ought to have a, uh, Competitors, of course, but then if you're competing, friends, okay, uh, for the Shanghai Gold, the okay, benchmark, and the Hong Kong Gold benchmark, and the RMB denominated gold benchmark, okay, I think all these add together, add together it becomes a gold industry in Asia. This is, uh, I think, I think, I think, I think we should have, we should have this. Uh, what do you call it? We should have this vision, and this is going to be the next new era's mission. Thank you. Interconnectivity. Interconnectivity. Right? Uh, <laughs> Philip has called the word in the beginning of how the industry has to be developed. Is it not going to be a prime position of just London, or even for the matter Shanghai? It will be. London, Shanghai, and, 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 and America, New York, and uh, interconnect with many sub nook and sub regional centers. I mean, uh, each uh, has, of course, have to be have sufficient threshold. I mean, if you don't have sufficient threshold, you will not survive. And, and naturally, as in what uh, Philip was talking about, this Darwinism, it will actually die. I mean, uh, only the fittest can survive. So, any question from the floor? Very shy to ask questions. Robin, you asked another question. I'll, I'll ask another question, okay. Um, so maybe for the exchanges and the products that are more retail oriented, uh, Thailand, Tocom, uh, how do you see uh, competing product categories? So, uh, Tocom, we heard exchange traded funds, but also increasingly we're seeing the emergence of very sophisticated online only vaulted gold providers. And then, even within your own exchange, I guess you've got the rolling spot contracts competing with the active month contracts. How, how do you see all of this uh, unfolding? So, I think just, just on that subject, in terms of, you know, we talk about cannibalization, I think the focus of the industry. Uh, and all, our, all the participants in the exchanges really should be, rather than cannibalization and talking about moving money around, we should see how we can get, bring new money into this industry. That's the basic challenge. Gold trading accounts for a minuscule part of the total retail participation, institutional participation. So the real challenge and, and the real sort of mother load would be if somebody uh, is able to bring in a new investor class into the market. And if an exchange or any contract is able to do that, that's where the real where the goal is, the real gold mine is. Well, I, I'll just add two senior comments. I think there is still like um, more rooms to educate people for the gold investment as like investment asset. Actually, there are so many people in the country which they already, you know, believe in goals. But how do we like um, convert these people to another new kind of investment setting? So basically, basically, having the same participant in OTC market and have the exchange basically in another aspect, it basically is the education for them to move to the exchange as well. I think every product they have the pro and con of itself. So basically, it depends on the in the investor to choose what's right for them. Yes, want to add? Uh, the fact that I talk about uh, more than fifty percent of trading volumes coming from abroad, uh, I think it shows that the uh, those who t are taking part in our market from abroad uh, is also taking part in let's say COMEX Gold and the other uh, uh, gold contract that has been listed, uh, which can be you know, competition, but uh, we believe that uh, there's a, uh, we are providing arbitrage trading opportunities uh, between these different markets. And uh, so it is important for the exchange to provide 
uh, ease of access to the market so that the you know, market participants will decide whether they want to trade in the both market or in the market and so on. So.